24 Sussex was uh, belonged and was built for uh, one of the lumber barons, um, Edwards, who was a big part of the bi development of Ottawa. It's a grand old house, but it looks so much bigger from the street, doesn't it? Because yes. uh, right from here on, it's all staff quarters. It's not our living quarters. It's really a more smaller apartment uh, where we live in a big house. Who are some of the people that you remember greeting at that front door? <laughs> Can't even begin. Well, of course, well, we'll get through there. We certainly had royals. had lovely people. I remember having uh, the Aga Khan, who's a, been a great friend, was a great friend of Pierre's, and he and his wife at the time, Sally, and they'd never had to, um, with their hands, I sort of didn't think about it, but they never had to, with their hands, um, pull apart a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> you served lobster and they had to pull they it had apart? They pull it apart. Well, that's the only way Pierre would serve it. But we laughed so hard. No, we had a good time. At the time yes. or later? No, no, at the time. At <laughs> okay. the time. At the time. Memorable. But yeah. uh, no, just so many one wonderful people. Um, what's interesting about 24 Sussex, of course, in the Prime Minister's role in entertainment is that there's no mandated entertainment that we need to do. Uh, all the state visits, all the kings and queens and presidents and great people who come uh, should be entertained by the governor general and he uh, or she does the state dinner and whatever. And so we only, we what we would get to do is during these state visits when these great people would come, we just have them over for supper the next night. <laughs> just us. Really? <laughs> Which, and so, so it was very intimate. Uh, you were the kids really involved? Get to, oh yes, always, always. Uh, well, we'll get to that, but Pierre used to keep the children very close to him. Yeah. What about um, for you? Did you leave the house through the front, through that front entrance? Or uh, and all you? I had to do was go with my hand on the door and it popped open because it was, it didn't lock properly, so I didn't need, <laughs> I was supposed to always wait until someone came to the door to welcome me back or whatever, and I'm just always in such a rush, I just learned how to pop the front door, a little brass thing, and I could get in. <laughs> I, they never gave me a key. They never gave you a key. Maybe no. it was always unlocked. Was no, it? No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Maybe. No. It wasn't. I. I. I knew. I had with a strong. <laughs> never mind. I'm sure it's fixed now. No one I'm can sure get it in probably so is. easily. <laughs> so the dining room had a magnificent ceiling. The beautiful chandeliers. It was a very elegant. We could control the light. Uh, uh, it, it was really quite quite a wonderful room. But it must have had imposing. such neat conversations. Oh, around the dinner department. Yeah. And I'll tell you one. So because of protocol, we had the Queen. There was a Commonwealth conference in 1974. And a lot of these decorations were on. The schedule was to be ready for when the Queen's visit in August. And so we had this infor uh, quite informal, but we filled the table with people. And we'd chosen um, c good Canadians, just normal people. We, it wasn't a fancy list. It was a very nice one. And I think I even grew the vegetables in my garden. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. She's used to that. I know. It was quite homey when I think how naive I was. But it was a lot of fun. So I'm down at the far end. Um, Prince Philip is down at this end, and, and the Queen is here, and Pierre is on one side, and Diefenbaker is on the other, and I'm down at my end, and I have Prince Philip on one side, and I have one of the funniest people, I won't say any names, I have one of the funniest people across from me, and we're howling down at our end of the table, because Prince Philip is really a very funny man, and so we're laughing, laughing, and the Queen suddenly is just scowling down there, and says, Philip, you're having flip, you're having far too much fun <laughs> down at that end of the table but we were lucky because it was stuffy down at his end up at his end not with Pierre but it was stuffy but it's it, it it's breaking the protocol and everyone accuses me of that of the well you didn't you know adhere to protocol protocol is there as a guideline but it really sucks the life and the fun out of this out of people it's the rule to get through any situation properly appropriately in the right way um, that's maybe the right way but it's not the kind and warm and human way so my breaking protocol was always just messing things up so people could relax and enjoy themselves not feel all all you know important and uptight did it uh, let you relax though yeah I had a lot of fun yeah and, yeah but no. did you could did you know the pushback would come because you've broken um, protocol? Or were well, the, oh, the, I didn't really break protocol I, I, I moved I only broke protocol once or twice 
and only when I was being kept out because I was a woman and I was quite a strong, I was just beginning to be a strong feminist and I was just so offended that, that I wasn't allowed to be part of when we were traveling, part of sort of press conferences or different things that the little woman was only needed for the dinners. So I did sometimes the push to get it. But no, most uh, towards the end when I was very unhappy, I probably didn't, I misbehaved. <laughs> did you have set times for your meals? Yes. So you knew that you were going to have dinner at yeah. six? Yes, so and I had to spend the, spend the morning figuring out the menu, giving it, handing it all in. I tried to do it a week in advance, but who knew what you wanted to eat and whatever. So my, my role was making up the menus and, and uh, getting them down to the kitchen so that they could produce the food. Did, were they able to produce food that was okay for the kids too at a certain stage or was well, it quite we had formal to, food? No, there was of course a kitchen um, and a, a, we had a big staff living in at that time. I think there were seven people who lived in at 24 Sussex other than us up in the in the what we called the maids rooms I, I don't think they called maids anymore but they were all just women who lived in and so they all were given breakfast lunch and dinner and they tried to the cook just tried to add the children to it but Sasha came up to me one day and he said mommy I don't want to eat any more shiny food <laughs> and I said what do you mean shiny food darling and he said well all the food is shiny and it's just sticky on my lips well I went down and there was a lamb stew with about this much oh. fat on the top because they were using in theory stuff for the staff it was just as uh, it was a, a a problem within the the, the staff yes. that there was somebody who really didn't respect very much the, the staff and gave them really lousy food while we ate quite well anyway I ended up taking over the children's food because uh, to me their nutrition was the most important thing and the nannies did as well so we were given time to go in the kitchen and make the food before they started the formal lunch Wow, how interesting! and we had our own little to be given of, time in your, your own but home I had my way. own yeah, I had my own little little uh, kitchen off the Freedom Room upstairs, mm -hmm. which we'll see, and um, I could have make my yogurt. I had the little salt and yogurt maker and all the food I needed to make for my babies. I could make it there. So we had the queen for dinner. The de decorations are all finished, and Pierre's leading her out of the dining room. We're all laughing, and across this new wool carpet, a huge big spider, I guess it had been in the flowers, was walking across the carpet, and she says, oh, mom. Margaret, is that part of the decorations? <laughs> Which just made me laugh so hard because you could see that we'd really, really tried hard to make it everything look nice for her visit. And the but spider it, was a huge try to ruin spider. It. No, it was so funny. We laughed. We laughed. Why did you call it the Freedom Room? One of the things that I I, I thought about. 24 Sussex that I wrote in one of my first books was that it was the crown jewel of the federal penitentiary system. I felt it was like a prison. There was always somebody for a young girl who'd, who'd grown up in such freedom in a big in North Vancouver in a big family home with comings and goings and everything. Uh, I really I, I felt imprisoned in this house. I also was a bit of a hippie, so from Woodstock there was Richie Haven. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Freedom, freedom. And so I, the first day I ran into the room with Justin and I was singing freedom, freedom. And from then on he, we all sang freedom. Because it felt to me that I'd been given a space that was mine. That everything else was formal and had no connection to me. Or And I'm very tactile about my house. Everything has to have meaning and be part of an organic whole. And yet I felt I was part of something so stiff and formal and certainly not part of what how I wanted to raise three rambunctious little boys. So this freedom room with its simplicity it's elegance, but it's fun. I mean, we just, the, the sofas we, were excellent for gymnastics, for everything. Uh, Why did you have to provide them yourself? Is it is that part of? The oh, just to not not cause excessive expense. Pierre was very conscious of not uh, spending taxpayers' money, and and we felt this was our private room, mm -hmm. and we took the furniture with us. Um, it was, we had to have some place that was just ours. Mm -hmm. And something I felt we had to have something with continuity too, mm -hmm. that there would be something left. But uh, no, it was important, uh, not nearly as important. This was just a room. Uh, we, the Prime Minister, the biggest perk I think of, of, of being the Prime Ministerial family is Harrington Lake. Mm -hmm. And we would be here during the week, but we would be just in the country at the most rustic, beautiful place and yeah. simple and very yeah. little 
help and, and could have a real life. There was, because the house, one of the problems with 24 Sussex that many people have talked about and we've heard is that it is in trouble structurally mm -hmm. and that it needs an awful lot of upgrades and it's electrical, it's plumbing, it's windows, a lot of, you know, deep hidden things, not decorations, not silk on the wall and fancy, fancy uh, decor. It needs really substantial work. And nobody has left 24 Sussex to let it have done. The, the, the Prime Minister right now uh, is, is not, it's not moving out to let the work be done. So um, it, it's a house that's very drafty. And when we were there, that was 40 years ago. And Pierre could not work in the winter on many days at the front of the house in our freedom room because it was so cold. Wow, for a man who liked the cold, that yeah. must no, have been No, it was really, freezing. there was a cold draft. Yeah. Um, and there always was, and it, you just felt it. Or if there wasn't a cold draft, there was a very hefty uh, heating bill because we were losing, uh, losing so much heat. So uh, the work has to be done. It's a beautiful house, and it, the decorations, we had it beautifully decorated. Each successive prime minister uh, has the option of decorating it or sprucing it up or fixing it where it needs to be done, and certainly it has been done. That doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters, <laughs> what matters is, is that the house itself is saved, and it needs to have work. So I think that, that um, you know, that's something that people have to be conscious of, that this, ha this is a great house, but it's not going to last unless it's, it, it, we do real serious work on it. And we knew that at the time. You know. And still <laughs> It's hard mm. to dis displace a family. Uh, so maybe the next person who succeeds uh, Prime Minister Harper uh, will let it be fixed up. What was your favorite room? Uh, the one that isn't in here, which was my my room up in the attic. Um, no, the Freedom Room, of course, but I, I, there was also another room. We didn't show the rooms up on the third floor. There was three or four um, bedrooms up there, and I just had them simply done, you know, just freshened up. But they were really for guests because we didn't have any room downstairs. But one of the rooms, when I had st stopped being the... I thought I could get away with just stopping being the Prime Minister's wife not Pierre's wife. You see the distinction? Oh. No, it didn't work. <laughs> so I lived in the house and lived upstairs and tried to not be part of the formal life and you know that and still be the, uh, the, the mummy. And so I lived upstairs in a little suite overlooking the river. Uh, that was a happy place for me and a sad place too, but it was real. I had yeah. my sewing room. I could make the children there. Their little flannel shorts and things. So no, I, I uh, 24 Sussex, I was only there for seven years. Still a long time. Uh, I had three children there, uh, and I faced, uh, to me, um, stresses that no young mom should have to go through. And what I'm talking about is the, the physical threat by the presence all the time of RCMP, and mm. you certainly know this. It's a different life. It looks like it's a very, from all these pictures, what a glamorous, elegant life. It was a lonely life, and it was a life that you're constantly aware that there is a reason to be fearful for your children, that there is people who might want to hurt them and they always have to be watched. You always have to call and get the police to come before you go out for a walk and blah, blah, blah. So that was a pressure too on a young mom that I, I found very difficult. Uh, the staff was fabulous. I loved all the people who work with us. They were great. Uh, but I wanted my own kitchen. Mm. I wanted my own garden, which we did up at Harrington Lake. It was a good balance having the two two together. Uh, a very beautiful home in so many ways, but be because it's a residence, mm. it's a, it's, it's not, it was never our home. Um, it, it, we were lucky enough, privileged enough, honored enough to be able to live there, but it was never going to be real. And that's a, that's the transient nature, nature of it, that it is a public home. And I think that what has to be done for 24 Sussex is to be kept as a, as a beautiful building, as, as history, as everything. Uh, it doesn't matter about the money spent inside on decorations. I think far too much is, of that has been done in the past. What it really needs is to be kept as a, as a, as a good building as a, as a residence that can carry on. I don't think there's any chance of it falling into the river, but it certainly certainly needs some work. I, and I may be misinformed on that too because it's been some years since I've been well, there. I think you're probably right. <laughs> so the formal entrance of the house um, with its big canopy and you know the mm. imposing stone structure. When you first arrived there, what were you thinking? What were your thoughts? Well, can you only imagine that Pierre Trudeau has been living there 
as a bachelor. When he arrived from 20, at 24 Sussex from the Chateau Laurier where he'd lived, he only brought a trunk, a leather trunk. He had no possessions, he had nothing. It was very convenient for him. So it really wasn't a home. So I had been dating Pierre for a couple of years and I had developed friendships with her, you know, like the people, and they were really hoping I was coming because they you wanted add to a have touch of, a home. Right. <laughs> they wanted a home. And, and uh, Pierre and I obviously liked each other an awful lot and they thought we were such a good couple. But anyway, so when I walked through the door, it wasn't to strangers. They, I knew some of them, but they were all lined up in their best uniforms <laughs> around the big big staircase and Verna one of the sweetest sweetest ones of them had had made all decorations and a banner welcoming me I was just overwhelmed well I was completely overwhelmed anyway because I just had woken up from this fairy tale of what have I done <laughs> where's my family I love getting ready for the wedding that was wonderful but the reality of coming back the biggest snowstorm ever in, in, in uh, Ottawa. So when we came back, the snow banks were five feet high. It was like coming into this a tunnel, a tunnel of white snow after leaving all the tulips and daffodils and green of Vancouver a few days before. But it was the beginning of a very different life. I was ecstatically happy, but I remember having a pair of pantyhose that had a hole in it and just throwing them, I guess I'd left them on the bathroom floor, find them in my room the next day, all in my drawer, all darned. <laughs> she'd, she'd done all that stitching you do on socks, socks, one of my the ladies who was taking care of me and I just made me laugh I said no you don't have to darn my stockings I, I didn't know how to let them take care of me I had never I'd been one of five girls we all had our chores we all had had to be part of a big team of getting this this family going and I was there just to be served and waited on didn't suit so it turned around the other way a lot I, I work with them a lot uh, I, I had some very good memories there of course the best memories was I had my three, three boys.